So what I'd like to do now is go ahead and kind of get started. Um, I'm going to do a little presentation on some documentation tips. For many of you probably have seen me around. I've been doing this for 600 years now. Uh, I, I have had um, about 15, 16 years in private practice. So this is one of the areas that's very special to me. My private practice focused on individuals with burns, limb loss, traumatic limb loss, um, and other catastrophic injuries. Um, and my caseload, my funding caseload was 99% uh, workers' comp. So documentation was very important for that and for some other aspects. Um, there's never a good answer, but there's always things that we can improve. And I've always um, advocated to my students and to my staff that you are the one that has the license, you are the one that's touching the patient, and you're the one that should do the documentation. And I say that because we actually had a vice president, non-clinical, walk into our area in an attempt to tell us how to document. That didn't go over very well in my, in my little house. So always remember who you are and what you're doing. So if nothing else, I want to give you some, some phrases to think about, some words, some different ways to analyze it. We recently in our organization um, went through a new software system um, and it was not rehab friendly. So as we were sitting there listening to all of it, I somehow befriended with one of the little designers and I made a comment that what we really need is, and I called it free text, that's the wrong word to use, it was rich text box, which gave us unlimited words. And I, we could do whatever. All the rest had a limit of 200 to 250 words. So um, in my conversation with her, I said, it would be nice to have that in every little section. You know, you have all these little clicky, click, 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 and that never tells you about the true patient. But underneath that, it would be nice to have a rich text box. Oh, my gosh, we got it. So, yes, we do actually type a lot in our documentation where we're at, but when you get through with that, you're able to read that documentation, step out of the office, and find that patient by reading it versus click, they were alert, click, they treated in the room, click, we did this kind of therapy exercise, click, I finished and signed my note. That doesn't say a whole lot. And also, uh, the other thing to think about is I have been involved in medical legal issues where I've had to review other therapists' documentation from anywhere from a year to five years from the time that they documented it. And as I've read it, I went, what happened? I have no freaking idea. And I've been on both sides, so I've had to develop questions t for the lawyers to go back and ask. And, you know, for many of us, maybe you've got a great brain and can remember somebody you treated five years ago. But if not, you better have to be sure that you documented well enough to recall the points. So kind of always think about those little issues. And it's not about you being sued, but it's about the whole lawsuit itself and what's going on with it. So very quickly, we're going to review uh, just some general CPT codes that are appropriate for therapy issues related to OT and PT. The 97112 is for balance kinds of activities, coordination, um, posture, proprioceptive. These are all things that especially our acute care burn certainly needs to do. I always say that they've kind of lost their body sense. They have no idea of how to move it again, especially if we have somebody even a 35% burn. Then we have to kind of rebirth them back through that whole process. Another code that uh, can easily be implemented is a 97110, and that is for strengthening, endurance, flexibility. And notice it says range of motion. Uh, we don't use that word. <laughs> we don't use the word range of motion. We use the word elongation. And I th hopefully by the end of the day, you will appreciate that word. Um, there's a difference truly in range of motion and, e and the word elongation. Um, Another code that is present in our CPT code books is 97124, and that is for scar massage. Now, I always challenge people when they say, well, there's a code, I can code for that. That does not mean you're going to get reimbursed. The other thing that you need to be aware of is that the funding sources are getting access, have access to the articles now that talk about um, scar massage 
is not, it does not create a lot of scar pliability. Scar massage does not increase length. Scar mis so they're saying we're not paying for it. So I'm going to hopefully provide you with some phrases and words that you can use that are a little different. Um, and what I always talk about, uh, I personally, I don't use this code. I don't want to fight that battle. Um, but I want you to think about what does scar massage really do. In many cases, it's applying firm pressure to that area. It's desensitizing them. And the other thing it's going to do is decrease their overall muscle tone and really help that uh, dopamine level. I love dopamine, and our patients love dopamine, and it decreases their anxiety. And then what happens? They move better, and they're better cooperative. So it's kind of like it has positive effects, but you have to talk about it in different ways. And besides our traditional OTPT codes, of which there's three different levels, there are other evaluation codes that could be utilized. The 97750 and 95831. However, many times these should not and could not be utilized with your initial evaluation code of low, medium, or complex evaluation. They may be very appropriate for a legal medical documentation or an FCE or a very special report. So that they are there, they're available, and certainly can cover more than one area. And if you note, there's some exclusions for that. Um, but for many of the things that we'll be doing, it's, it's very appropriate. And the other thing that I want to kind of attune you to is, what is our time worth? We know we have value to these patients. There's no doubt in anybody's mind. But what is our time worth? So some of these codes, these are based upon uh, reimbursement rates from my local Mid-South geographical area. And that's the other issue. Should I move to California? It could more than likely be lower. Uh, if I move to another area, it could be totally different. So there's no general flow for what the, the cost range is. Um, but you can see that there's a variance for that first code as much as $20, $30 between just the commercial insurance people. And for the evaluation codes, it could be as much as $100. So you really do want to get with your billing department and see what are the, the codes that are, the current funding sources are doing. And then figure out the words and phrases that's appropriate. And you almost have to do that almost every year. Um, it's based upon who's reading the note and who's doing the insurance authorization in that company. So as we all know, what you can say or document can either help you or hurt you. And we're all very aware that documentation can foster you know, our reimbursement rates, can foster our um, um, revenue, and certainly for increasing our staff. But it may help us or hurt us that very next day in medical rounds when the doctor says, I read your note, and I didn't get much out of it. Or I read your note, and you know, Sandy, I think, I think, you're right, I think we do need to Botox that and get going, so I've already ordered it up. I'm like, yay, great. You know, it saved me 30 minutes of trying to chase you down. So be aware that it can have immediate uh, impact. And we really have to identify what is the real problem. In the acute phase of a burn, it's not necessarily a joint problem, and yet sometimes I hear therapists saying, well, we've got a joint problem. Not yet, not necessarily. We have a skin problem. Well, you may or may not. Later on, yes, you may have a real skin problem but need to identify what is the real problem. So is it muscle tone? Is it muscle tightness? Is it capsule tightness? Is it a muscle trigger point? Those are all things that as a therapist, we all have skills and knowledge in which to impact and change and be able to document what it is, what muscle groups, what's the level of intensity, what did you do, and what was the result by the end of the session? And what was the carryover if you're gonna see them again later that day if you're in an acute care setting or within a couple of days if you're in an outpatient setting? and document and identify, you know, is it a scar tissue problem? Is it a scar adhesion problem? Is it a scar band problem? What's the location? Where does it span? And when does that scar band really affect movement? Is it only whenever the trunk's rotated or is it whenever the shoulder is flexed beyond 100 degrees? That's when the elbow bends, what, you know, what is the issue? And how would you document this? Okay, I'm sure you all have done this, right? Sometimes I hear people say, well, I'll document I did range of motion or I passively moved them through. Is that, and that would be correct. 
But every one of you are licensed, and every one of you went to school for how many years to acquire the ability to get that license and provide treatment. So you need to show to the funding source there was a value for you to do what you just did. So I challenge you to think about how to tell that story. Therapists implemented manual techniques. Therapists had to utilize manual techniques, which included elongation, neuromuscle inhibition, uh, elongation of multiple joints, had to start, you know, you, for some of our clients, maybe we can only start with one particular area and then incorporate more. We did, had to do place and hold. So document those. Develop you little phrases that you can click on and pull up and uh, decrease some of your documentation time if you need to. And how would you document this? Twisted presto position? <laughs> I mean, elongation can occur wonderfully with some of our um, yoga positions, some of our modified positions that we do. So you describe it in terms of objectively position. You know, prone position, quadrilateral position where the hip flexion is greater than 100 degrees. We had shoulders at 90 degrees. We were able to sustain that for 10 seconds before they required a therapist intervention for stabilization. So again, you've got to tell the story and document it that way. And whenever you are looking at the wrist as you're going to be acquiring the skills in your breakout sessions, you know, I very rarely do I document just wrist flexion and extension by itself without talking about supination, pronation, what did the digits two through five MPs, what were they able to be positioned at? Were we able to do a composite fist? I mean, many times I'll say joint motion was great, uh, wrist in neutral could acquire full composite flexion wrist. Uh, with 20 degrees of uh, wrist flexion, we had extreme tightness and will require greater uh, elongation to return to his mechanic job. This can be done through burn rehabilitation specialized techniques. So again, just to show wrist flexion, composite flexion, wrist extension, and then you add in your supination, your pronation, your elbow flexion. So you kind of, it's not just about always the numbers. Certainly when you're doing your hip um, position, you know, we always want to look at the lower abdomen, and it's nice to get them in sideline position, especially even if they're in the ICU. So you can get that hip into some extension. You can see what the abdominal is doing. How much knee flexion can you get? How much could you get before? I mean, if you think about it, passively, most people in most cases can get their heel pretty close to their butt. So what's happening? And whenever you're looking at the neck and the head, you really want to be able to look at what's happening to the scapula, what's happening to the clavicle, where are they positioned, can they get into that position. Maybe they can, but their muscles are too weak, the scar band's too tight, what intervention can be done. And you really want to tell the story, as I've said. For our acute patients, after they've gone to surgery a few times, I mean, we see them from the moment they come in for s multiple hours every day, but at some point, as their collagen becomes a little stronger, we end up needing four to six hands on that person to position, to elongate, to maintain, to get everything just exactly right. And that means two to three staff people helping and assisting. So how do you document that? How do you show that? Well, gee, we already have a, a precedent set for that. Many times surgeons, two surgeons, are in the OR room at the same time. And what do they say? I performed this aspect, my partner was present and performed the rest and will do so in a separate report. So your therapists need to be able to communicate, talk well, and say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about, you know, required assistance of three to maintain the position to get this and this and this, why don't you talk about such and such and such, but you've got that whole component. These people, many times, with the amount of collagen they have, cannot be effectively positioned and treated by two hands. So you need to be able to do that. And I know that we're all being pushed. I, st I still just refuse to look at us as being a Walmart theory. You know, run them through, it's about the revenue, do a charge. I've actually had administrators say, I don't really know what you do down there, but I can come down there and generate a charge. And I said, well, what we do is we treat real people and we get them better. So it, I realize everybody says, well, I don't have time. And there's times when you really want to say to that administrator, because I got my hand on my patient and the other one is typing my note, okay? 
I've even had that administrator tell me, well, you have a laptop. You can take that with you as you're working with the patient. I said, and do what? You know, I got a leg on him. I got my hand on him. I probably got my other arm on him, and somebody else was holding them down. My nose does not work on the keyboard. So, again, you're going to have to justify yourself. And there's days, too, when you really want to say, I help someone. I improve their quality of life. I help them reach their potential and gain independence. And administrator, what did you do? I have so far kept that in my brain. So I want to thank you for the moment, and I appreciate your time. Uh, I can take time for some small little questions just before Scott gets started, if anyone has any questions. But uh, welcome to San Antonio. I hope uh, you guys are here. If you are here through Saturday at least, uh, you tour our burn center. We'll be giving that tour on Saturday afternoon. I'd like to introduce uh, some of the staff from the Army Burn Center that's here with me, uh, just walking in. And not that he just got here at the conference, but uh, uh, it's Captain Kyle Cunningham. He's our chief PT, and he is going to be assisting in the breakout session uh, for the shoulder. And Major Ashley Welsh is right there to his left. Uh, she is our chief occupational therapist, and she'll be helping out with the wrist and, and, and elbow breakout session. And uh, Sergeant Thomas Berlew is one of our assistants. He's going to be assisting with the hand with Mr. Chris Casey, one of our occupational therapists. We're doing the hand as well. And to his left is Miss Patty McGlinchey, who will be assisting with the knee and ankle. Um, and just a forewarning for those of you that are not at this hotel, the Rock and Roll Marathon is Saturday, Sunday morning. So if you have to commute, uh, prepare because they're going to be closing a lot of the, the uh, streets. So if you're staying here, you're lucky. So I'm not sure how we'll get here, but we'll somehow get here. So, um, And Sandy, i got to say, for doing this for 600 years, you age very, very well. Um, but I'm going to expound on what Sandy was talking about as far as the influence of tissue. Because it's... It, it's so important to identify what tissue is involved, what I'm going to refer to as the target tissue, what is involved so you can effectively design a treatment plan. And I gave this talk at the American Burn Association Conference uh, back in March, April. And um, so if you were there and you heard it, I apologize. I was asked to repeat it uh, for this specific uh, conference. So uh, if you saw it, hey, go get some coffee, okay? But, uh, and if you want to refund, go talk to Vicki. I have nothing to do with that. Okay. So as we mentioned, this is specifically of the hand and hand evaluation assessment, looking at the influence of tissue. But you can apply these principles throughout the entire body. And these, these principles are the premise behind the uh, goniometry techniques, the new goniometry techniques we utilize for burn patients, which was recently published in JBCR uh, by Ms. Ingrid Perry, it's our lead author, and we finished a study that looked at, I believe there were six other centers as well, looked at the influence of scar tissue and how it affected goniometric measurements. And we tested 11 areas, and nine of them were specifically influenced with these revised positions. So I encourage you to uh, look at the article, read the article. And with that, uh, that study, we, had a, a, we developed an app for the phone, and it's iPhone and Android. So if you do not have the app, it is free. So during the break, please download it. It's, it's called SCAR Goniometry. If you've previously downloaded it, get the update because uh, that update has the hand in it where the original one did not. And so you, you, we want you to download it during the break because you probably can't get reception in here. Maybe you can. Um, and then so you can utilize it in the breakout sessions. So... Right. So we are going to talk about the the how many people in here have used the figure eight method for measuring hand edema in their practice. Okay, 
So uh, a handful, no pun intended. And, and so we're going to talk about that technique. And one of the breakout sessions, Mr. Casey and Sergeant Ballou uh, will be giving you more hands-on practice with that technique. What is the cause of the range of motion loss? And then lastly, we'll go into some motor testing. Because a lack of motor can influence the tissue as well, because you can't actively move that tissue or stress or elongate uh, that tissue. So those patients are going to be more prone to contracture. Very common uh, scene here where you have a patient Primarily upper extremity, trunk burns. Looks like it's super. It's a full thickness. Got some escherotomy in the chest, likely in the extremities. Circumferential full thickness. So we're already thinking these patients are at high risk for neuropathy, loss of motion. They're going to get grafted. So long term, high contractual risk. Short term, we want to maximize that tissue perfusion. So we want to control their edema. So with the elevation early on. So these, this particular patient, we have an elevated, we have a, uh, some contraptions uh, attached to the bed to elevate the extremities with the idea of trying to, uh, to raise those hands up above the elbow and above the heart to reduce the edema. But standard measurements, how do you know whether the edema is getting reduced? Well, standard measurements are you stick them in the volumeter, and how practical is that to do in an ICU? So when we did the study, we looked at a figure eight method. Tape measure takes 30 minutes, and it was reliable and valid compared to the gold standard. So now that's all we do is the, the figure eight method. This I'm not going to go over. It's for your reference. Uh, in non-burn population, and this is what we studied. That should be in your handout. And these are your, the landmarks that will talk you through it, uh, exactly what to do. So now let's change gears and talk about the, the, how we're going to measure the motion. And first we need to identify what is the target tissue or what tissue is tight. And, and go through the system of how we determine which tissue is tight because it could do, be a multitude of reasons depending on how long it's been since the patient was injured. It could be the skin, the scar, which could start in a matter of days. It could be the tendon, it could be the joint, um, and it could also be some tendon adherence to where the tendon isn't moving because of that scar tissue formation. So some basic rules as you apply anywhere in the body. You need to measure motion both actively and passively. The active motion deficit is going to tell you more different things than the passive motion measurement. Passive motion deficits are going to tell you if there's a tightness limitation. Okay, what I refer to as a scar tissue or a tissue, soft tissue issue. So if you're trying to ascertain if there's a tightness issue, your measurement should be passive. If you want to see if there's any type of tendon excursion issue or, or adhesion, your, me your measurement should be active. When you notice that there's an active deficit, rule out that there's no type of neuropathy or uh, tendon disruption. That can also cause an active motion deficit. But please just put in the back of your mind, if you notice the combination of a motor loss and a, a, a soft tissue or a tightness, um, you're going to have issues with both the above and the active deficit combined with a neuropathy is going to, and combined with a, a deep burn, is going to uh, magnify their contracture risk. So putting all those two together, all those three things together, hopefully will help you prioritize your treatment plans. Not only you know, it's, I, here I am telling you that not only should you measure actively and passively, you need to measure passively with the adjacent joints in different positions because you want to stress the tissue. And you want the tissue, whatever target tissue, whatever tissue you're trying to identify as tight, you want to pick a joint 
and you need to measure it twice. And you want to measure it with that tissue on slack and on tension. And that takes time. So I hear it all the time. We don't have time to do these measurements. You're asking us to do these, all these measurements, multitude, we're just going to do it once. Well, okay, <laughs> but how are you going to identify what the problem is? And how are you going to design an effective treatment plan? It's like if I go to a doctor and the doctor just says, hey, you got the sniffles, let me give you this antibiotic. Well, how did it, is it viral? Is it bacterial? Why are, you, why are you throwing this at me if you don't know what my problem is? So we have to identify what is tight so we can identify uh, proper treatment plans. It just takes time, which is a battle that Sandy was, was talking about, is you have to have documentation. So those are the basic rules. Measure twice, whatever tissue it is, put it on tension, put it on slack, compare the measurements. If you notice that the tissue or the range of motion for whatever particular joint you're measuring is less when that particular tissue is on tension, you know that's your problem. And that's what you should focus on. So you can apply those principles anywhere throughout the body. And that is the premise behind our, the revised goniometric positions that you'll be doing the breakout sessions with. So hopefully you'll notice a pattern through these scenarios. That's all we're doing. Knowing the anatomy, putting the tissue on tension, put it on slack, comparing the measurements. Who in here has heard of the term cutaneous functional units? Okay, good. There's more than anticipated. That's good. A cutaneous functional unit, or I refer to as a CFU, is the field of skin that's responsible for permitting range of motion. And it is defined as um, it's, it's located proximal to the moving joint. So the CFU that permits elbow extension is on the anterior arm. The CFU that permits elbow flexion is on the posterior arm. And the skin will move in the direction of motion. So as you are performing elbow extension, the skin is going to move distally. So we move it in one direction. Interestingly enough, a study we recently completed in uh, 2014, it, we, um, on these patients, it was 14 other centers, 14 centers total. And we looked at the amount of CFUs that someone had compared to the amount of therapy they had and the amount of total body surface area of involvement. And their, the outcome was their range of motion and found that the amount of CFUs that were present in that injury compared to the amount of TBSA, the amount of CFUs was more predictive for how much therapy they required than the TBSA. So a 2.5% a hand burn with about 30 CFUs is going to need more therapy than an 18% trunk burn. Just a way to quantify what the therapy needs needs are. So that can help you with your justification uh, for your documentation as well. So here's a diagram of the hand. So if you if you look here, this is from the SAGE program. And this here is the MCP um, extension crease, but it's on the dorsum of the hand. And we're looking at where MCP uh, flexion is occurring it, because you have, this is a dorsal hand, so the skin is recruited proximal to the MCP joint to allow MCP flexion. So if I'm looking just to simplify it, uh, there's, there's a CFU for each along each metacarpal, but just to simplify it, this is one big CFU. There's really four, one, two, three, four here, but all this area, if it's involved, is going to limit MCP flexion. So that's what I'm going to focus on. If it, if it was just that involved, that would be affecting PIP flexion. And if they're both together involved, then I would anticipate a problem with combined MCP and PIP flexion. So here's an example. 
So applying the same rules, I'm picking the PIP joint. This person, if I just looked, if I have the MCP in extension and I have this person flexing their PIP joint, it looks like they have pretty good motion, right? 90 degrees of flexion. Hey, they're pretty good. They don't need therapy. But then if I come a little further and I say, well, let's stress this tissue. So let's place the MCP in flexion. You can see this blanching already long here and now remeasure the PIP joint flexion with the MCP inflection how much do they have there now pretty significant difference right so this is telling me that it's the skin or the scar tissue on the back of the hand that is limiting this person's motion the joint is fine I don't need to worry about the joint it's the skin so all I did was put the skin, the target tissue, on tension. I put it on slack. I measured the PIP joint twice. I noticed that there was less flexion when this, when this tissue was on stress. So I know I should focus the treatment on combined PIP and MCP flexion. And I have the documentation to show the deficit and to monitor progress. Took more time, but we were able to ascertain what the problem was. If you do that same system and the motion does not change, automatically think they have a joint capsule tightness. So now the intervention should focus on the joint itself. The skin on the back of the hand is under tension and under stress, and it did not change. It's roughly about 60 degrees each. So now I know this person has a joint capsule tightness. I'm going to focus efforts on lengthening the PIP joint. The intrinsics of the hand can also affect someone's range of motion. It gets a little more complicated because of the anatomy of the intrinsic muscle. But just to remind, remind you, the MC, the intrinsic muscle, the what I'm referring to as the interossei and the lumbricals, they go volar to the MCP joint and they go dorsal to the IP joints. And so if you draw on your hand, you see these uh, marker red markers will show the joint axis of the PIP joint and the MCP joint, you draw this line and this represents the intrinsic mechanism or intrinsic muscles of the extensor mechanism. You hear the term intrinsic plus, well when the intrinsic muscles are activated, they're contracting, they're going to flex the MCP joint and extend the IP joint. Intrinsic plus position. But if you passively look at the muscle, I'm passively placing this MCP in flexion, and I'm passively placing the PIP joint in flexion, you can see this muscle is slacked. Not a lot of tension on the intrinsic muscle. Conversely, if I extend the MCP joint and simultaneously flex the PIP joint, that muscle is at its greatest length. You have tension here and tension here. So we apply the same rules that we did for the skin. Is our target tissue this time is the, in the intrinsic muscles? We're going to measure it twice. We're going to measure the PIP joint flexion passively because we were trying to rule out tightness. And we're going to measure the PIP joint with the MCP inflection. And then again, when the MCP is an extension. And if we notice there's less PIP flexion while the MCP is simultaneously in extension or hyperextension than it is with the MCP inflection, we know that that's that intrinsic muscle that is tight. So what you did was we just described the intrinsic tightness test utilizing the same principles that we've done for ruling out skin tightness. So just knowing the anatomy of the intrinsic muscle, you can figure that out. So now, if we just did a skin composite simultaneous reflection, if we just measured it this way, because we think that this person might have tightness because they have a dorsal hand burn, we would say, hey, these patients are good. 
But if we look a little further, we see that it may not be the case. Look at this person on the right. He was good. He had a graft on the back of his hand. He had good PIP flexion with the MCP flex. He doesn't need therapy anymore. But his complaint was, my hand feels tight. You're not tight. Look at your hands. Great. Look, got good mobility. But if you look a little further and do the intrinsic tightness test, this is all he had. It's all the, P the PIP flexion he had when that MCP was extended because his intrinsic muscles were contracted. That first picture, you see the person with his hands elevated, swollen hand. Expect about a month later, you potentially could see this because the tissues were just fibrose with persistent edema. Usually doesn't happen right away. Usually about three to four weeks later, anticipate this. Tendons. Remember the same rule. Target tissue, less motion when that tissue is under tension. Let's look at the flexors. If I just looked at the picture on the right, you can see that he's, I'm measuring his digit extension because I'm trying to assess the tightness of his flexor tendons. So if I measured it with his wrist and flexion, what does that do to the flexor tendons? It puts it on slack. And look how much flexion, look how much extension passively this person has. Full extension of the digits. Well, if you look to the picture of the left, he has very poor passive flexion. So if you just measured it this way, you would think that this person has a PIP joint problem, right? Hey, he can't extend his PIP joint. But if I put the flexor tendon on slack, his PIP joint extends all the way. It's not a joint problem. He has a flexor tendon tightness. So now our interventions are going to be working on lengthening that, flex, that flexor tendon. You can document this two, two different ways. The easiest way is to document, put the fingers in full extension, move the wrist towards extension, and document the amount of wrist extension that they have once you lose full digital flexion. You could put the wrist at a certain position and measure uh, digital extension and have you know, several different measurements. That just takes longer. You can do it whatever way you want. I prefer to, as soon as I lose passive digital extension, I document how much wrist extension they're at, and then you can see how they make progress. Extensor tendons, now they're going to have a deficit as passive flexion. If you look at the bottom picture, you would think that this person has good passive flexion, which he does, but the wrist is an extension. Now, if I flex the wrist, that's all the amount of flexion he has. So this person has an extensor tendon tightness. So interventions are going to be geared toward elongating those extensor tendons. So you're applying the same principle, just knowing the anatomy and figuring it out, identifying the target tissue, and designing your treatment plans accordingly. It's tough sometimes when you have a burn on the top of the hand, the dorsum of the hand, the dorsal forearm. How do you differentiate whether it's a scar tightness or a tendon tightness? couple of factors. Time, it takes about two to three weeks for those tendons to tighten, whereas scar will start tightening as soon as that proliferative wound phase occurs, three to five days. Look at the end feel. Look at the blanching of the scar tissue. The end feel for a tendon tightness is more springy. The end feel for a scar tightness or skin tightness is softer. So those are some ways you can differentiate. But the treatment's more or less the same. You're still lengthening that tissue, placing it in flexion if you have an extensor tendon tightness or dorsal scar tightness. Now we're going to switch gears, talk about the active deficits. Whenever you see that the active flexion particularly deficit is less or the deficit is more, they have less active motion than they do passively, 
automatically think this person has adherence of their flexor tendons. It's another reason you have to measure both. Now, if they have full active motion, of course you're not going to go measuring passively. But if you notice their passive, their total passive flexion, if you combine their MCP, PIP, and DIP together, how many people in your practice, be honest, how many people measure compositely? You're measuring combined MCP, PIP, and DIP together. Okay. You should because that is going to lengthen that tissue. Mr. Casey will talk about that because if you're just looking at the isolated joints, it's not going to actually stress that tissue, which is likely going to be tight, which is at the dorsum of the hand. So if you, so if you combine those, the term for that is total passive flexion. It's the amount of MCP, PIP, and DIP together. And you have to make sure they are all flexed simultaneously and get the respective measurements as they're flexed together. You can't measure MCP isolated, meaning I'm only isolating the MCP, only isolating the PIP, and only isolating the DIP, sorry, and then combine those measurements, because that's not truly giving you what that tissue length is. You have to combine them together, put all your documentation in the, in the, in the chart, MCP, PIP, DIP. And then if you do the same thing actively, you notice that the active flexion is less than a passive, you probably, they probably have a ten, tendon inherence problem. So bear with me. This, this picture is a, to, to denote the flexor digitorum profundus, which inserts on the distal phalanx. I understand it's a rubber band, okay? And I put some, I put some tape on there to hold it in place. But whenever someone's actively flexing their DIP, what is that flexor tendon doing? It's gliding proximally, right? So if you have a gliding problem, just like I'm having a problem finding this laser on the screen, there it is. Okay, if you have a gliding problem, this person's not going to have as much ability to flex the DIP, correct? because it's not going to want to move. But right now, this tendon is at a mechanical advantage because there's no slack in it. So any little excursion that's going to occur is going to do what to the DIP joint? It's going to flex it. Well, how can I make that more difficult, more challenging for somebody who has a tendon excursion problem? Well, if I go to look at the picture to the right and I flex the digit passively, it's putting slack on this flexor tendon. So now whenever there's slack in a tendon, in, in order for it to produce active DIP flexion, that slack has to get taken out. So any limited excursion that these patients have is going to go towards taking that slack out before it can actively flex the DIP. So if you notice somebody has less active DIP flexion with their MCP and PIP inflection than they do when it's an extension, they have tendon inherence. So that's how you can document change and that's how you can document the deficit. So lastly, we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about motor loss and I'm going to talk about median, ulnar, and radial nerve the three most affected nerves of the upper extremity with neuropathy. If you remember anything, hopefully you remember several things from this talk, but if you remember one thing when regards to neuropathy, you have two goals. One is to limit the soft tissue tightness that could occur from the muscle imbalance. And two is to substitute for that motor loss. So now we're going to apply those two rules, those two goals to each one of the nerves. If somebody has a radial nerve palsy, they're going to have a, a deficit of wrist and digital extension. 
So what, what muscle group do you suspect is going to get tight as a result of this imbalance? The flexor tendons. So we want to make sure we're integrating flexor tendon lengthening early on when someone has a radial nerve palsy. We also want to substitute for their loss of digital and wrist extension. And you can do that. You've probably made or seen all kinds of different radial nerve splints. This is just a static one, and it allows there's some elastic for like in your, on your underwear that's, that's passively bringing the MCPs up in extension. Just one way to quickly do it. Median nerve. If you notice that the person's thumb is adducted, or if they cannot touch the tips of their fingers with the tip of their thumb, and not because of a tightness in the web space, okay, you should suspect that they have a median neuropathy. They may, if it's been there a while, have some atrophy in their DNR eminence. All the intrinsic muscles of the hand are either innervated by the median nerve or the ulnar nerve. There is no radial nerve involvement for the intrinsic muscles of the hand. There are a lot more ulnarly innervated intrinsic muscles. So don't mem remember them. Memorize all the median innervated mu uh, muscles. So what I like to do is tell people to remember, since I like food, is meatloaf. Not necessarily like meatloaf, but regardless, it works, right? So mead loaf, and you stutter a little bit on the L's. Mead for median, and the loaf for the muscle. Median, first lumbrical, second lumbrical, opponent's pollicis, abductor pollicis brevis, flexor pollicis brevis. So test those. You test the opponent's pollicis by doing the tip-to-tip -tip test. You test the abductor pollicis brevis by doing palmar abduction, which is this motion here, going away from your palm. Flexor pollicis brevis is dual innervated with the ulnar and the median. So I usually don't test that, but those two I will test. So what kind of contracture is this person going to be at risk for developing, particularly if they have a burn on the top on the dorsal of their hand? A first web space contracture, because their motor function is preventing them from actively abducting, and the tightness of their skin is going to pull them into adduction as well. So you want to make sure you're aggressively holding them into palmar abduction with splinting, and that splint's called a C-bar because it's just like a C to hold the, the thumb up in palmar abduction. Lastly, ulnar nerve. F positive froment sign is a test you can do, and I'm gonna, not even going to try this video, okay? But uh, what it's, what's happening is this video, it's a positive froment sign, is when the thumb IP flexion, when you tell somebody to hold a piece of paper between their index finger and their thumb, and you tell them to do it without flexing their thumb, and they can't do it, and they, they substitute and they'll compensate and they'll hyperflex their thumb to hold that piece of paper. And this is called positive froment sign because the owner innervated adductor pollicis that's responsible for pinching is not working because the owner nerve is out. So the median innervated flexor pollicis longus is compensating and they're holding the piece of paper only using their median innervated muscles. That's called positive froment sign. When you see that, that's you should suspect ulnar nerve. Also testing AD and abduction of the digits, okay, because that's not part of meatloaf, right? What muscle does this? Interossei. Is there any I in meatloaf? No, right? Well, I say there's no I in team, right? Well, there's no I in meatloaf either. Because so you know that's ulnarly innervated. It's not part of meatloaf. So you know they have an ulnar nerve problem. What can we do about it? Well, remember the radial nerve digital extensors 
are going to hyperextend their digits at the MCP. The flexors, long flexors, are going to pull the IPs down. So they're going to get in this position, clawing position. So if they have a combined palsy, you're going to see this. The thumb's going to be out. If their thumb's in here like here, it's just the ulnar neuropathy. So these patients can't grab anything because their fingers are up like this. If they have a burn on the top of their hand, you better believe they're going to have a problem with MCP flexion. So what can we do about it? Well, we can substitute for their motor loss and lengthen the tissue at the same time with what's called an anti-claw splint, which is this splint right here. This splint is basically allowing active flexion. It's holding the MCPs down in, in flexion just by this little bar. And there's another bar across the palm that you can't see. And it's mechanically blocking the MCPs from extending. So as they extend their fingers, it's not allowing the MCPs to extend. So all the extension force is going to the IPs. This little slip of tendon right here that goes from the, remember, the inner osseae and the lumbricals are intrinsically motive, uh, innervated here. And they're out. They are not working. The long extensors are radial nerve innervated. So that's working. So when you mechanically block the MCPs from extending, all the extension force goes along this little collateral tendon that connects the extrinsic extensor to the intrinsic extensor, and that attaches along the distal phalanx. So if you just block the MCPs from extending, that allows this radial innervated muscle to extend the IP joints. And now they can flex, they can extend. So you're reducing their risk for contracture. You're allowing them to more functionally use their hand. Anti-claw splint. Tricky to make, but very effective. That's all I have. Thank you very much.